Um, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Lena Gade. I am a vehicle dynamics manager at a company called Multimatic. They're a Canadian based company with numerous sites around the world. Um, and one of my other functions is also as a race engineer. Um, here's a small snapshot of some of the cars I've worked on. Um, I'll go on to talk about a couple of them. Um, most of these have been uh, cars that I've worked on since 2011. So um, my current job is twofold. As I mentioned, um, I'm a vehicle dynamics manager. I look after a four-post four rig and a, a full motion simulator in a place called Thetford, which is near Cambridge. Um, and I'm also a, a lead um, car engineer or race engineer for a Multimatic-led prototype team who race in the US in a series called IMSA. Um, a little bit about my background and how I got into motorsport because I think it is probably quite a different thing to, to maybe some other engineering fields. Um, my past has included working for Bentley Motorsport, uh, where I was a, a technical manager, where I supported customer racing teams in a series um, that supported GT3 race cars. Um, I was also um, working at Audi Sport, which is what I'm most well known for. I was there for nine years, five and a half of which was as a lead engineer or race engineer from 2011. Um, and during those five and a half years as a lead race engineer, um, I won 13 out of the 33 races that we competed in, one world championship and three overall Le Mans wins. Um, I became the first woman to get it once, then twice, and then do it three times, so I guess it was kind of a big deal. Um, <laughs> um, obviously, I was at Manchester University. My background's in aerospace engineering. Um, and I graduated in 1998, but because I had no experience in motorsport, I had to go into the automotive field. And I'll be quite honest, um, automotive never really inspired me. Um, it, was, it just wasn't where I wanted to be. I always wanted to do motorsport. So in 2003, um, I got involved with various different race teams by volunteering to work for free on weekends. And by doing that, I, I gained experience. I learned um, whole new concepts and things like that, but I made contacts. And really, those, those years um, at Jaguar and at Myra, and then also um, working on those weekends, that's what taught me all the basics that I needed to know when I wanted to make a full-time transition into motorsport in 2006. Some of the cars at the bottom there are some of the cars that I worked on during my time working on weekends. So I actually also used to use my holidays as well to go off and do racing, which my family never understood. They um, couldn't work out why I wanted to spend my time with well, cars and, and boys, really, um, that I had no interest in, but okay. <laughs> anyway, so why did I choose engineering and motorsport? Well, um, when I was 10, I knew I wanted to become an engineer, and by the time I was 14, I knew I wanted to be um, an engineer in motorsport. Um, my parents um, are Indian and quite strict. They'd moved to the UK in the 60s, and the reason they'd done it is they wanted their kids to have more opportunities than, than they had had at the same age. So we were encouraged um, to study, and to study quite hard, but at the same time, they wanted us um, to be inspired by what we learned. So when I was nine, we'd moved out to India, and we, we were there for two and a half years. I've got two younger sisters, and with my parents being, let's say, a little bit more strict. If we ever broke any of our toys, we were told to repair them. Um, and we were encouraged to fix things or to learn how stuff worked, um, to, to look at how things were done and improve daily tasks. You know, what would you do differently if you had different technology available to you? And it was, it was a good way of um, getting interested in engineering because those are some of the concepts that you use every day in, in engineering as a field. Um, it also helped that the electricity was turned off during the day. So without computers, and we didn't have a PlayStation, it was a bit early for that, um, we took apart things like the stereo, the radio, the video, all the furniture in the house. Um, the washing machine got left alone, and we'd put it back together, and we'd see, you know, all the spares you have left over afterwards, and do you really need them, or can you use them for something else? My mum only recently found that out as well, so... <laughs> Anyway, after two and a half years um, in India, um, we moved back to the UK, and my sister, who's three years younger than me, got hooked on Formula One, because um, her school friends at the time were watching quite a lot of F1 at the time. 
It was the early 90s, um, and Formula One, I'd say, at this point in time, was incredibly technical. It was leading various different fronts for car development. And alongside um, the technology that was going into the cars were the people and um, engineers, drivers, um, mechanics, various different personalities. And the power of TV is really what got us hooked into Formula One. Um, the likes of Murray Walker and James Hunt, who used to do the commentary, um, they focused not just on the cars and on the racing, but on also the people that were involved. So my role models as a kid were guys like Ross Braun, Adrian Newey, Frank Williams, and Patrick Head. Notice they're all engineers and they're all men. And it didn't matter to me because, and the same for my sister actually, because she's also in motorsport at the moment. Um, they were people that were doing something that we were inspired by and that we wanted to go and follow. So age 15 or 16, I do my, my GCSEs. I completed four A-levels, um, maths, physics, chemistry, and French. And then I came to Manchester to study aerospace engineering. And I'll be honest, um, within a couple of weeks, I didn't want to be here. Um, I'd come from a girls' school. And as has been mentioned, there were only five girls on the course. The rest were guys. It was quite a culture shock. Um, and it was quite difficult to adjust to it. I do remember speaking to my mum who said, you've wanted to do this since you were tiny. If you give up now, you'll never know what you could have become, so stick it out. And I did. I also knew very quickly that um, my idea of becoming an aerodynamicist and being in a wind tunnel for the rest of my life was not going to happen. That, that wasn't where I wanted to be at all. So um, I carried on with a degree. In my final year, I did a placement in um, industry. And this could have gone wrong at this point. Um, I wasn't a great student, we'll go with that. Um, by the time I came back to university, I couldn't understand what my engineering degree was for because a lot of the concepts that I'd learned on the engineering degree weren't being used in industry, or at least that's how I very naively saw it. And I was convinced by my tutor to carry on and finish the degree. I came away with a, a lowly 2-2. Um, but I'm glad I did it because Actually, what an engineering degree does teach you is how to think, how to address problems, and how to apply those in, in the real world. Um, you might not be sat down doing your FE calculations by hand. You have a computer to do those nowadays, but you do need to understand the background to it. And so lesson number one there was complete the degree and don't let your mum and dad down. Um, as I said, I, I moved um, to um, Jaguar and then on to Myra. Um, one of the things about um, getting those two jobs, in the meantime, whilst being at university, I made over 150 applications to motor racing teams across the UK, Europe, and in the US. And without fail, every single one replied back and said, we're going to keep your details um, with us, but you need to go off and get more experience. When you have, come back and speak to us. I still have all of those letters. They're in a file. And one of the reasons I kept them was because there were contacts on them. It's, it was the old way of doing it, not having like an Outlook diary and putting things in there. Um, but also because every time I looked at them, I thought, OK, I don't think I want to go and do that side of motorsport anymore. Being with that kind of team, I want to go and do something different. And it was really important to have that behind me. Um, but coming out of university with debts, you have to go and get a job. So I did, and I went to Jaguar. And things were really slow paced. Um, not everything was always performance driven. And at the time, I remember getting quite down on the fact that I wasn't working in motorsport and I wasn't making much headway. Even though this stuff was going on on weekends where I was volunteering for teams, that big tick wasn't coming along. Actually, it was probably the best thing that did happen to me. It gave me a chance to go and work with cars hands-on. Um, I was responsible for um, o the overall performance or noise vibration harshness performance of cars for Jaguar um, on specific projects. And so all of a sudden I had this massive grounding in cars that I never actually had before. And now when I look back at it, obviously it was a really good thing to have done for a while. So a little bit um, about motorsport and why motorsport is a passion. So here are all the reasons why motorsport is great. It's a very negative sport. It's about numerous people in a team. It's very political when everything goes wrong. It's a huge lifestyle. 
Um, you're always traveling, you're never at home, you never see your friends, um, and you never really are around for your family. That's exactly why you should do it. Um, okay, no, those are all the negatives. That's part of the story. Um, for me, motorsport is about technology, it's about um, learning, it's about bringing together people from various different cultures with various different backgrounds and languages, making them work together because they've all got one aim, which is to take a product, to take a car, and to get it from A to A as fast as possible in a given time frame. And that's the part that inspires me. So all the negatives sort of go out the window. Um, I really love the fact that you have a very short time scale in which to make a decision and to make choices and to develop something. But moreover, sometimes you have to make a decision with only 80% of the knowledge and you've got to somehow tell people and convince them that you know exactly what you're doing. So you have a, let's say, a face that you put on and you kind of just put it out there and you go with that decision and nine times out of ten you get it right. Of course it's based on experience, it's not just a case of having some inspired knowledge hit you that you might know something that's going on. Um, in all the years that I've been involved in motorsport, and especially my time at Audi Sport, I have actually developed a very close circle of colleagues who've become really good friends and are almost like family. And the excitement and emotion, along with that sort of um, environment that you can work in, is something that inspires me to stay in motorsport every day. So a little bit about what a race engineer actually is. So this slide here, um, there are three columns which represent three different cars that Audi Sport took to Le Mans in 2015. Um, Le Mans is, is one of the greatest races in the world. It's been going on for a really long time, since the 1920s, when car manufacturers wanted to go and show that their cars were the fastest yet the most reliable over a 24-hour um, distance. Audi have been involved in, in sports car racing for a really long time. They unfortunately pulled out at the end of 2016 due to Dieselgate. Um, turns out that you can't race a diesel car and then lie about your emissions. It's a bit, a bit iffy. But anyway, as you can see up here, um, the very first column, which is the one labelled number seven that's red, that was my race car. And all those people under that column are people that I would be looking after or I would be managing, let's say. Um, in this instance, there were three drivers, between eight and ten mechanics, five support engineers, and we would have that basic structure, whether it was a race weekend or it was a test weekend, and usually you'd then have extra staff on top who would be overlooking performance across the three cars, overlooking chassis issues across the three cars, overlooking engine performance across the three, and then all the multiple number of managers that want to come and be seen at Le Mans. So as you can see, it's, it's a huge team. Um, in 2012, we took four cars to Le Mans, and there were over 240 people in the team, including marketing and catering, which is a, a, huge, a huge number of people to have just for a 24-hour race. Um, one of the biggest challenges with all of this is on that um, screenshot, there are only two female race engineers. There's myself and a strategist. We were the only females on the team. Everyone else was male. The ages were all different. We had mechanics as young as six, 16 or 17, engineers who were coming close to retirement, people who um, were from various different backgrounds, German, Dutch, Japanese, French, Italian, Brazilian, um, just everywhere. Common language is obviously English, but English was um, a language that some people were strong at and other people were not. So take all of that in the mix, a huge amount of money being used or being put on this project. Um, and at this time in 2015, Audi were racing against Porsche, who were a sister company in the VW group, and Toyota. Um, and it was, it's commonly referred to as the golden age of sports car racing. It's, it's taken a bit of a dive since then. But it was, it was big money, and these cars were hybrids. They represented everything that these brands and these manufacturers wanted to put out to the um, public about what they were doing um, racing-wise and also what they were selling to them. Um, <clears throat> so it is quite challenging, or it was quite challenging. Um, on the opposite side, when it worked as a team, it was phenomenal because everyone was driven in the same direction. 
And I think one of the reasons why it worked is there was a mutual respect of everyone's opinions. And there was also a mutual respect of the hierarchy of who was making decisions. And then actually, if you did get something wrong, it was about the team failing, it wasn't about an individual. And I'll come back to that a bit later in, in the rest of my presentation. So as a race engineer, what do you need to be able to do? So firstly, you need to be able to make a decision. And you'd be surprised in industry how tough it can be to make a decision or get a decision out of someone. Um, you've got to be able to listen. The one thing I learned quite early on is that I didn't know everything. And because I didn't know everything, I had to ask questions of other people and I had to listen to them and objectively decide how much of that information I believed was going to be of benefit or was correct for me or was going to be for the best um, development for the team. You need to be able to suggest ideas, but you've also got to accept that you're sometimes you're just not going to have um, a solution to a problem. And you've also got to be able to receive ideas from other people very openly. It, it is one sport where you are incredibly exposed, where all of your um, strengths and weaknesses are out there for people to see and for people to pick at if you're in the wrong environment. You need to be relatively detail-oriented and be able to adapt to situations and scenarios incredibly quickly. Experience does help, but also having people around you who have been doing it for a long time, it's, it's really good to sort of fall back on them and ask them how things are done. And I have plenty of people, plenty of peers that I still turn to now, even after my time at Audi Sport, who I would go to for advice, whether it's for my career, whether it's for... Um, an issue that I found on my, the next race car I'm working on, whatever. Um, really important, many people can't accept that they've made a mistake, let alone admit it to themselves or to an entire team. And it's the one thing that I always made sure I did, partly because I didn't want anyone to think that being a female engineer in motorsport making a mistake was a weakness. I was the only person I think that saw it that way but I wanted to make sure that people knew I was human just like everyone else. So I will always hold my hand up if I make a mistake and I expect the people I work with to do the same thing. You've always got to want to learn and to, to better yourself. Um, I think that's really important in, in any industry or in any job because if you're not doing that, you're not um, being creative and you're not learning anything more than, than sort of what you've been taught in your books. And that's not what life's about. That's certainly not what... Um, being inspirational is about either. Um, unfortunately, motorsport, if, you, if you're not delivering, people say 110, 120%, yeah, you just need to deliver, to, to deliver results and performance, but you need to do it as a team and you always need to see where you can um, improve the next time that you come back to a race event. And that means not being afraid to make a mistake. Um, and I've made plenty ones that I should have got fired for and ones that I didn't make that I did get fired for, which I'll explain again later. You also have to have a huge amount of confidence. And I will say one thing about all of those traits up there. When I was a kid, I had none of them. I was not confident. I was incredibly shy. Um, I wouldn't make a decision. I had to learn all of this. And some of it had to be learned whilst I was on the job. There is no book or guide to this, um, and I get asked by plenty of people, you know, what advice would you give me about getting into motorsport? I want to do what you do. And the thing I would say to every, anyone who is interested in motorsport is, you need to decide if the lifestyle is the first thing that you're prepared to adopt. Because, as I mentioned before, we do a lot of traveling. I've just flown in from Florida this morning, um, jumped on a train to come up here. This happens a lot. Um, there'll be times when I'm not around on a weekend to see my family or I miss a wedding. Those are things that you as a, as a person wanting to come into motorsport need to accept first. And if you can do those, then the rest of it becomes a little bit easier. There is no book, as I said. A lot of it is gaining experience. A lot of it, of it is putting yourself forward and trying something. Um, I would never have dreamt when I was nine that polishing a car at a racetrack would allow someone, would allow me to then be given a computer where I could download data and then analyze data and talk to a driver and coach a driver through a lap. I didn't realize that's how it worked, but it is how it works. You need to know exactly how an entire race team works before you can decide which little part of it you want to be involved in and which part you want to specialize in. 
Um, I've talked a little bit about Audi Sport. Um, Le Mans is very, very close to my heart, primarily because it was the very first race win I ever had with Audi Sport, and also because it is a phenomenal race. If, if you do ever get a chance to go to Le Mans to see it or you get a chance to, um, to watch some of it, I, I thoroughly encourage you to. Although if you really want to sit down for 24 hours and follow the entire race, I would understand if you got a bit bored after a while. But here's a short video that Audi Sport made in 2015. It was after that, uh, sorry, in 2014 after the race. It was their final Le Mans victory. They never won again there after 2014, unfortunately. And it was the final win that I had with, with them in, at Le Mans as well. So, um, <clears throat> just a little bit um, as I finish up about being a role model. Um, I never set out to be a role model um, or to, to have any fame or anything like that when I, when I decided I wanted to be an engineer in motorsport. That's all I wanted to do. I just wanted to make cars go fast and to enjoy being part of a team. Um, but apparently, it's quite a big deal for a woman to um, walk into a male-dominated racing series in a technical role and um, to be quite dominant, to be, uh, to be winning and... Um, how can I put it without sounding like I've got a huge ego? Basically setting the benchmark for where everyone else should be operating at. Now, I don't see it that way. Um, if, I, if I was male, if I was given these opportunities, I'd expect that someone would do exactly the same thing that I did, which was to just go to the nth degree to make sure that you were the best out there. Um, on the opposite side, obviously that has happened. Um, and since 2011, since my first win at Le Mans, um, Things have been a bit difficult, personally. It's, it's not something that I handle brilliantly, I will say. Um, I get stopped for autographs or for photos with kids um, or with fans. Um, I'm asked for interviews almost as much as the drivers in various race teams are. I've been featured in TV commercials and in a film. None of that was something I wanted to do, but it comes as part and parcel of the package. And actually, as daunting as it is, you need to stay relatively grounded that um, it's just a part of the entertainment industry, let's say. But it's actually also really important because it's inspired so many young kids, um, male and female, to take up engineering or to get interested in the sciences. And I think that was the part that I've taken away the most from it or the part that I will say I enjoy more and can deal with the, the publicity with things like that. Also, I think people, they do like to see um, others succeed and it's it's good for them to have those role models in place. And on the opposite side, it's also, um, it can be a negative, as I discovered um, last year. Um, at the beginning of 2018, I moved to the US to compete in a series called IndyCar, and I was a race engineer there. It's a very different series to anything that we have in Europe. They race on road courses, so standard race tracks as we know, street courses and ovals, and there's um, a very precise science behind how you set cars up for an oval. So if you've never done it before, it can be quite daunting. Um, the, the reason I went is because I needed a new challenge. I needed to do something away from Europe. I needed to learn a new technology. I needed to learn a new way of racing. Um, and that huge learning curve was something that absolutely inspired me, so I went. On the opposite side, for IndyCar, as a series, it was a really big deal to have a European race engineer come over. And someone who had had quite a lot of success in a different field, primarily at Le Mans, um, because for them, they have many ups and downs with their series, but it was a big sort of selling point for them. So there was a huge amount of publicity at the start of last year. Now, without going into details, it just didn't work out. And um, unfortunately, the team decided to um, release information to the press. And there were headlines like this all over the place. And at the time, I remember, because it's one thing to get fired for something that you haven't done, and I can maybe talk about that over coffee at some point, um, but it's another thing to have those headlines come up because my parents were in England, my sisters were in England, my friends were in England, and I'd only warned some of them that this was about to happen. I never expected it to sort of get to this level. And maybe your ego stands out in front of you at this point. You feel incredibly hurt. You feel incredibly slapped in the face. What made this worse is that seven days later, one of the journalists who'd, rep who'd um, reported this 
then reported on a confidential conversation I'd had with another team um, about possible employment. So at that point, I shut down all my social media and I decided I was going to take a break from motorsport to decide if I wanted to stay in the business or not. And thankfully, I have a lot of good friends in the industry who gave me their opinion, gave me their advice um, about whether I should quit from the industry or if I shouldn't. And the reasons for why I should do it, you know, if you want to stop, you stop because it's your choice, not because someone's pushed you out the door. Taking five months off was great. I went to Galapagos, I went to Ecuador, I went to Mexico, I went to Sweden. I just did loads of stuff that I wouldn't normally do because this lifestyle that I'd had before of constantly being involved in motorsport meant that I didn't get to do those things. And at the end of it, I realized that none of this matters. The sun still rises tomorrow morning, whether this comes out there or not. The sun still rises whether you win or lose a race as well. It doesn't matter. What matters is, do you want to go back and be in, in an industry which you enjoy, where you've got a lot of friends, where you have a huge amount of enjoyment and pleasure from inspiring people, or do you want to work, walk away and do something different? So I did go back. Um, as I said, in October of last year, I joined Multimatic. And um, I can't be that bad at my job, because um, I've just come back from the Daytona 24-hour race, where the car didn't finish but it did qualify on pole, and it beat the lap record, which has been in place for 26 years. So my, my journey from Manchester to, to Daytona has only just started. I want to thank you for listening.